In 2015, uh, there was an 18-year-old woman from Australia. Her name was Essina O'Neill. She quit social media. Now, uh, that might not seem significant in and of itself, right? Every day, lots of people quit social media. What made it significant about her departure was uh, the timing and the reasons behind why she decided to quit social media. She had over a million followers across various platforms, half a million on Instagram alone. If you're not familiar with Instagram, it's one popular photo sharing social media site. She had built a huge career for herself uh, as a, a model and as a social influencer, but somehow that success didn't translate into happiness. She writes about this experience online. It looked like I had the perfect life yet I was so completely lonely and miserable inside. I hid it from everyone. I smiled and laughed in pictures, but I felt exhausted trying to keep up this bubbly, funny, happy facade. So at the height of several major proposals with modeling, I started freaking out. Why am I so unhappy? Why do I feel so lonely, surrounded by so many people? Why do I hate myself so much? What's wrong with me? She had reached the lowest point in her life, but then she decided to do something about it. She decided to expose this airbrushed happiness for what it really was, and here's how she did it. She started rewriting the captions on her Instagram photos to show that, in her words, social media is not real life. In these rewritten captions, she described how she felt during the photo shoots, what was going on behind the scenes emotionally, even as that photo was being taken, bravely showing that while she appeared to be casually happy, she was hungry, tired, angry, and lonely. She revealed that photos where she appeared to be effortlessly beautiful, they, they took hours to manufacture, dozens of retakes coupled with layers of photoshopping effects. Then after she recaptioned these photos with all of those real descriptions, what was really going on, she posted a few photos and videos of herself without makeup, without any camera filters, to change reality so that she could start embracing real life. This was her strategy to reclaim her life. Now these decisions cost her her career. And many people thought she was making a terrible decision. How could you not be happy? People would say, look at everything you have. But she had come to a crossroads. Would she keep pursuing a life of airbrushed happiness, which only looked fulfilling, or would she choose to have a real life, unfiltered? Airbrushed happiness, or joy without a filter. Our passage in Ecclesiastes confronts us with this question this morning. It's a long passage, but there's one unifying theme throughout this passage. How do we find enjoyment in this life? Will we choose airbrushed happiness, desperately trying to squeeze meaning out of this life, even while it leaves us empty? Or will we choose unfiltered joy, viewing the things in our lives as opportunities to experience moments of genuine grace, with the everlasting God of love. With these questions in mind, let's read together our passage. Uh, as Pastor Jimmy said, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll be reading, uh, again, a little bit longer of a passage than usual. It starts in verse 12 of chapter 1. It goes all the way through the end of chapter 2. Let's devote our attention now to the word of God. I, the preacher, had been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom. 
surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold of of folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise... As of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life. Because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And yet, who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Brothers and sisters, thus far in the reading of God's word, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for your word, for this passage for its searching beam that sticks into our hearts and our lives, and we ask that you would now give us the grace to hear from you everything that we need to hear. 
confront us, challenge us, but also comfort us and build us up in it. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's return to that question. Airbrushed happiness or joy without a filter. As you can hear in the text, the sage of Ecclesiastes is no stranger to this dilemma. The sage in our passage gives us some tell-all autobiography. He gave himself fully over to finding meaning and value under the sun, but when he got it, it failed him. Think of our passage, our text this morning, sort of like Miss O'Neill's rewritten Instagram captions. Here the sage recognizes that he only had airbrushed happiness instead of the real thing, and so he exposes it as fully empty as he looks back over his life. And here's what he has to say. When you lean on temporal things for lasting value, you end up even more unhappy. He gives us this sad news up front in the beginning of our passage. Here's the final assessment of life under the sun, all that he has gained. It's all vain. It's all temporary. It's ungraspable. It's enigmatic to try and find meaning here. When you try to snatch hold of it, to squeeze value out of it, it's like trying to catch the wind in your fists. You close your fingers around it, but then when you open your hand, it's empty. The best, the best that this life can offer you on its own terms is the awareness that something's wrong. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. In other words, when you give yourself over to this world to find true fulfillment, it leaves you mysteriously and hopelessly disappointed. You know that something's off, but you can't fix it. You know that something's missing, but you can't quantify it. Again, when you lean on temporal things for lasting value, you end up even more unhappy in this life. For proof, consider Exhibit A, a snapshot of the sage as the paragon of wisdom. This would be verses 16 through 18 in chapter 1. After years of work, study, effort, he's finally achieved his goal of being the most knowledgeable person in the room. It's an enviable position, of course. We might have a similar longing in our own life. Surely such great wisdom makes one happy. But if we look a little closer at this photo, we see that something's wrong. Proverbs 3, 13 says, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than the gain from silver. But the sage says in verse 18, in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So what kind of wisdom did he have? It doesn't sound like godly wisdom. Wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord and ends in the delight that we hear about in Proverbs 3, 13. No, apparently our sage had mastered worldly wisdom. A, a type of wisdom, sure, it's an ability to discern truth and to succeed in life, but this is more like street smarts or like a, a type of worldly savvy than true wisdom, maybe like a career mentor who has great, excellent advice of how to succeed in the workplace, how to manage your work-life balance, how to please those in charge so you can advance, but this person can't necessarily advise about morality in personal matters. Such wisdom makes the sage a sought-after guy. But it doesn't satisfy his deep request for lasting joy. It looks good, but it's empty. And the sage agrees. His rewritten caption for this snapshot could read, Here I am, striving after the wind. Let's consider Exhibit B. A snapshot of the sage is the paragon of status, power, and pleasure. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Now, there's never been a more impressive photograph. He says so himself. 
Just look at the impressive array of people and entertainment and pleasure and wealth set against the lush background of these vast private gardens that would make Claude Monet jealous. Surely this must be lasting joy. Except this picture is worse than the first. Now, in this picture, the sage says, my wisdom was still guiding me as I tasted of these earthly delights, but as we just saw, his wisdom at that point in time was not godly wisdom. So we shouldn't be too hasty to give the thumbs up to all of his actions here. Look closer at the snapshot and we'll see a deep pride at work. What's he doing in this snapshot? He's trying to be God. Where else in scripture do you hear of a garden? Uh, with all kinds of fruit trees planted in it intentionally, near a body of water to irrigate it. Sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? The sage, in his pride, was trying to recreate paradise. But there are some cracks in his version of paradise. As we think a little bit more critically about the text, his list of possessions includes a vast collection of people. But God alone, according to the scriptures, has ownership over humanity. So what else is slavery except the sinful, prideful thought that I can be like God by possessing my fellow human? This confirms when we look deeper that the sage's wisdom here in this particular section is worldly wisdom. And it doesn't work. Can fallen hands and corrupt intentions recreate paradise? No. The sage devotes vast amounts of energy. He tells us about his great expenditure of energy, and it still comes up short. For all of the abundance that we see in this photograph, it leaves him empty. It's nothing but toil. Toil. That word uh, occurs 15 times in this whole passage overall. One Bible dictionary says that the word translated here often as toil, it, it points to the dark side of labor. It's a, a great phrase. It points to the dark side of labor, the grievous and unfulfilling aspect of work. It's the perfect word to describe the forced labor of slavery. Deuteronomy 26.7 uses it to describe the Israelites and their slavery in Egypt. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. There's a bitter irony in this text. He who thought he was godlike to the point of enslaving humans, in the end experience his, his work like slavery. The one who oppressed others ends up feeling oppressed by his labors. Temporary things leaned on for lasting pleasure do not satisfy. Worldly wisdom cannot construct paradise. In spite of the outward appearances of happiness, the sage concludes to this snapshot, this too is vanity. Well, let's consider exhibit C, our final snapshot, a snapshot of the sage considering his legacy. This is chapter 2, verses 12 through 23. It's time to pass the torch to the next generation. Can he at least be happy with his legacy? He's been very wise. He can see some advantage to his knowledge, as he says in verses 13 and 14, it's better to be savvy than a complete fool. But he realizes that he's still going to die like one. All of his savvy can't save him from the grave. And so he feels like his efforts are wasted. Well, what about his wealth? Will the next generation use his wealth wisely? It's out of his control. And even if everything does go well, in a few generations, everything will be forgotten. And so he despairs. He hates his life. He hates his work. The facade of airbrushed happiness wafts away. His accomplishments turn into dust in his mouth. He had everything except happiness. This is what life under the sun has 
for us. Temporary things cannot bring lasting joy. And when we try to make them bring lasting joy, they let us down. But it doesn't stop us from trying, does it? Most of us have our own version of airbrushed happiness. We could give our own personal history using recaptions, snapshots from the various things in our lives, things that we turn to to give us ultimate fulfillment, or areas where we put up with spiritual emptiness because we at least have outward success. The text offers us a few possibilities for us to trigger some conviction and imagination, knowledge, skill, status, Possessions, pleasure, legacy. What is it for you? What's it for you? Now, to be honest, it's often hard for us to understand exactly what it is for us in the moment. We often need some sort of wake-up call, like as Cena O'Neill experienced or the sage experienced. So let me ask it a different way. Where are you tired now, if you haven't slept well or if you have young kids, you might kind of chuckle a little bit and say, I'm always tired. Uh, but I, I don't mean just physically, momentarily tired. I mean deep down, bone weary, emotionally and spiritually exhausted. You're tired from trying to maintain a facade or from returning to the same bad habit even while it leaves you flat. Where are you tired? This might indicate your version of the sage's worldly pursuits. Here's one from my life. Uh, many, as many of you know, uh, I've talked about this before, a few years ago I hit a wall in ministry. I started to have uh, panic attacks on Sunday morning. Now with any mental health crisis, there are multiple contributing factors, of course. But a main one for me, as I came to find out in retrospect, uh, through the help of a very experienced counselor, was that I was trying to maintain the facade of being the perfect pastor never letting anybody down, never disappointing anybody, being all things to all people, always on time, always put together, always having an excellent word or excellent song to give. I wasn't good at extending grace to myself. Even as I acknowledged, of course, from the pulpit that we all need the gospel, so I couldn't keep it up. The airbrushed facade of being the perfect pastor crumbled. Now, one or two little words. This doesn't mean that all mental health problems ultimately boil down to a sin issue. Again, multiple contributing factors. But for me, again, one of those contributing factors was, I think, a form of spiritual pride. Jesus is the only perfect shepherd. He's the only perfect pastor. And I'm not the Christ. So part of my recovery involved learning grace-based self-acceptance, learning how to accept reality. Now that Christmas, when I was in the midst of that recovery, Melinda bought me a gift, and it remains one of the, the favorite things that anyone has ever given me before. It's this mug. Uh, and uh, if you can't read it, let me just read it for you. It says, world's okayest pastor world's okayest pastor. What actually a virtuous thing for someone who struggles with perfectionism. Talk about grace-based self-acceptance. This phrase, world's okayest pastor, was an invitation to remove the airbrushing and the filters on my identity as a pastor, to let Jesus be the savior, to find grace in failure and apology and forgiveness, to let go of my pretenses and just enjoy life. It's very interesting. When we stop pretending that we're happy and accept reality, we actually become happier. This isn't new age pop psychology, by the way. It's Christian spirituality. It's the gospel applied to life. It's the sage's offer for us this morning. Worldly wisdom delivers only airbrushed happiness, but godly wisdom leads to joy without a filter. The everlasting God offers us temporal joy here and now. Instead of looking to the world for lasting value, appreciate the world as a gift from God. 
Let's hear verse 24. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This is an unexpected move, isn't it? After verses of the sage turning us away from the world, it gives us a little bit of emotional whiplash. What are you talking about? We probably expected him, when he sets up the world as a place of failure, we probably expected him to tip it over and offer spiritual things in its place. But what does the sage do? After telling us that the world has no lasting value, he turns right back around and points us directly back into the world to find a sense of meaningful joy. Because the problem isn't with the world. The problem's with us. We misuse the world when we lean on it for lasting value. It's a temporary thing. It wasn't built for that kind of pressure, so of course it fails us. But when we find our ultimate source of meaning and value in God, the world becomes a source of partial, temporal enjoyment and relief. Maybe it's less glamorous than airbrushed joy, but at least it's real. The path to real joy without a filter, as we look at the text, begins by seeing God differently. Our scripture this morning gives us two ways of seeing God. It starts off by viewing God as a miserly boss who just gives us empty labor that we'll never fulfill. Here, verse 13 again of chapter 1. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. This is a downer, but this is the view of God from under the sun. And unfortunately, many Christians feel that way too about our Heavenly Father, that he's not as good as he says he is, Uh, that he denies us access to real pleasure by constantly saying no all of the time, or that he doesn't like us enough to give us good things, lasting things, or to save us from trials. Uh, This is, I think, one of the reasons why Christians can flock to material goods for fulfillment, even though technically we know better. Sometimes we think that at least we can just get a little bit of excitement from them, even if it's fleeting, compared to the hard work of learning to delight in God. Now, maybe this view of God possibly sees rightly God's displeasure with sin. It recognizes something true about the human experience, but it does not fully appreciate God's desire to bless Ecclesiastes 2, verses 24 through 25 acknowledge both of these realities at the same time. Yes, there's a cost to sin. Life in a fallen world involves toil. There is a dark side to our labors, but even in toil, says Ecclesiastes, God extends blessing. And to be clear, let me be very clear about this, it's a present blessing present now through the common things of this life. The 19th century pastor and writer Charles Bridges writes that the world, the world, with all its legitimate enjoyments, is the Christian's portion. The world is the Christian's portion. For the worldly person of verse 21, this world reeks of temporariness. Because sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone else who did not toil for it. But for the righteous person, this world is filled with joy. Here a similar language, but very different in verse 26. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Our God is not miserly holding back good from us. He pours his blessing on us, partially in the form of earthly delights. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. Do we trust that this is the character of our God? Do we trust, do we deeply believe that in Christ, God's posture towards us is delight, love, blessing, 
and a blessing that extends to enjoyment in this world. Christianity says that God exists in perfect joy and delight in the Trinity. God, the Father, Son, and Spirit exist in perfect joy and delight together. And then they created us. God, the triune God, created humanity. Not because he had to, or he was missing something. God created us because he wanted to, so that he could share his great delight and love with us. It was an act of pure love that he made us. And then he gave us the world as a place of beauty, a place of pleasure, where we could commune with him. God and the world existing together. But we lost that pure and perfect enjoyment of God and the world when Adam first sinned. So now the world competes with God for our affections. But the gospel promises us that God restores our relationship with him and our relationship with the world so that we can rightly enjoy them both. Christ died, not to free us from the world simply, but to free us from a sinful attachment to this world. And in the process, Christ's crucifixion unlocks the world as a place of genuine joy and communion with God. Christ's resurrection from the dead is God's great yes and amen to the created world, to our bodily existence, because Jesus was raised in the flesh. And then in God's kindness, that resurrection life flows into our lives now, offering us meaning in everything that we do. The sage, in his worldly wisdom, hated all of the toil in which he toiled under the sun. It was vanity. But the apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that because of the resurrection, because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, in the Lord your labor, your toil, is not in vain. The gospel points us back to life in this world and says, enjoy it. Sure, there are limits. We're not to be hedonistic. God does put boundaries on the things that we're supposed to enjoy, and there is a spiritual joy in denying ourselves certain worldly pleasures. We'll have plenty of time to talk about that in the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes. So again, there are certain limitations, but if we don't appreciate the stuff of this world, we're rejecting God's good gifts. I was on a bike ride the other day uh, before the weather turned nice. It was oppressively hot on this bike ride. And all of a sudden, as I kind of crested a hill, this wave of cool breeze washed over me. Uh, and I said out loud, that's heavenly. Maybe you've experienced something like that, some sort of form uh, of relief or unexpected delight in terms of, or in the midst of something challenging. Now, some people might think that it sounds blasphemous to compare a mere cool breeze with the absolute glory of heaven, but I would argue that this would be the only Christian response. Every time you experience something delightful, it's an encounter with God and his mercy and kindness. It is heavenly, so enjoy it. Charles Bridges goes on to say that for Christians, common mercies are sealed with covenant love. Common mercies are sealed with covenant love. Because our deepest need is met in Christ, we can savor life in this world as a gift of God's love. This doesn't mean we won't have hardships. This doesn't give us permission to become gluttons. It doesn't baptize the health and wealth gospel that says that God only wants us to be rich. All of these things are some version of airbrushed happiness. But it does mean that Christians can find spiritual refreshment through material things. That the world is once again a place where we can experience God and commune with him. So what's the difference between squeezing the world to find lasting value and savoring the world to enjoy God? Gratitude. Gratitude is the difference between those two things. Here's what John Calvin writes about gratitude and our 
earthly life. If we want to curb our ungodly passions, we must remember that all things were made for us with the purpose that we may know and acknowledge their author. We should praise his kindness toward us in earthly matters by giving him thanks. That's what John Calvin has to say. Praise allows us to avoid hollow enjoyment of the world that only leads to emptiness by causing us to focus on God as the giver of all good things. So, friends, this week, enjoy your life and give thanks to God. Go out of your way this week to experience something delightful and then go out of your way to give God thanks for it. When you encounter any good in the world this week, strain to see God's fatherly hand in it, giving you a small taste of his love and his pleasure in you. Far from mere toil, this is priestly service. Our grateful enjoyment of the world transforms the stuff of this world into praise for God, the way that fire transforms an offering into a pleasing aroma. What redemption we have in Christ, where every act of eating and drinking becomes communion with our Father, and where every sigh of grateful delight becomes a declaration that Jesus is on the throne of heaven, showering us with gifts from on high. Brothers and sisters, this week, go forth into the world as priests of our God and enjoy your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for a challenging message, one that we're not used to hearing in many of our circles. We have trained ourselves in some ways to uh, not enjoy the things of this world, in part because we, we can be afraid we know how easy it is for us to slip into improper enjoyment of the world. And so we ask for your guidance, for your spirit's help as we navigate life this week, that we would properly enjoy your world, and that as we enjoy our life, we would experience your grace and kindness. Help us to commune with you, even in the midst of our toil. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.